Okay, good evening everybody. Um, tonight we are all set. We have Dr. Timms back with us. Uh, Dr. Timms uh, has been working very diligently with us to uh, help with the coordination of our comprehensive study and he is completing or he has completed the fiscal portion of the study tonight and so He's back to give us uh, what he found. Uh, he created, he, he looked through and looked at our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and he'll share a little bit about that. And then board towards the end of the presentation, he'll share recommendations for the future. Great. So it's been a pleasure, let me start by saying it's been a pleasure to work with him, and uh, he will uh, share. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to him, if that's okay, and then board, uh, I'm sure we'll have time for questions in there. Absolutely. Good. Well, thank you very much for having me back. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me take a look at all these items. I've been driving just about everybody in the district crazy, so for this uh, few months here, and uh, I'm sure they're, they're glad to see uh, this report come to fruition. Now, you have a PowerPoint, but all I ask you to do is not get ahead of me, because I'm, I'm an ex-social studies teacher, so this, this all becomes a story. Okay, so this becomes like a story. All right, so you got to kind of bear with me. So uh, what I'm going to try and do is I've got one up here and a board over there for everybody. And if you just stay with me, we can go through the story. So here was the game plan. The game plan was to take a look at the 2016-17 budget guidelines and strategies. Uh, the whole idea was to find out exactly how you build your budgets, what your budgets are made of, what's in the budget, what's not in the budget, what should be in the budget, what, what's left out of the budget. Uh, those types of things. So what I tried to do is go through every piece of the budget uh, development. Then we looked at your reserves and fund balances. The controller, of course, is, that's a favorite topic with the controllers. The amount of reserves you have, fund balances, where they are, how much they are, what they're used for, and what they are not used for, okay, which is always a problem. Debt service issues for capital projects and buses. So we tried to look at your debt service, which is basically your interest and principal payments over time for current debt. But we also tried to look at potential debt uh, down the road. So we tried to look at both those things and maybe the idea of uh, a capital reserve and how that could be helpful to the district. Uh, we also wanted to take a look at the calculation of surpluses uh, and those types of issues related to revenues and expenditures. Now remember, budgets to be oversimplified is money in, money out. Right? Money in, money out. Kind of like when you get your paychecks, money in, and all people buy groceries, it's money out. So that's basically the whole idea. But the big question is, is more money coming in than is going out? <coughs> now that's one question. The other question we want to know is, whatever you're planning for your paycheck, did it come real? In other words, was your paycheck what you thought it was supposed to be higher or lower than what you were supposed to get? And you have estimated your expenses, that's called your budget. Did your budget really come in higher or lower than you estimated? Now, you got to remember how a budget's built. Uh, so you just had a budget vote, right, third Tuesday in May, and uh, congratulations on that. But don't forget, it started being developed probably the November before May. And actually started taking a look at, you know, where things were budgeted, the budget codes, how your spending patterns are going to play out, and so on. And you really develop a budget that was approved in May that won't take place until July 1, but has to be survivable to the following June 30th. So it's quite a stretch that you have to estimate. Then we looked at the long-range financial plan and related issues because it's not a question of can you pass a budget now. The question I'm always asking is can you pass a budget four or five years from now? That's really the key question because everybody builds a budget annually. They call it the annual school budget. And my suggestion to you is, having taught finance at Syracuse University, is that's a big mistake. I think you've taken the right steps to look at this thing long, longitudinally, long, over the, a period of time, to find out if the current patterns, if they continue to exist, where will you be in five years? And we've got some estimates on that. The next thing what we did was, I did do the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, and threats, and district practices. So you have other consultants working in other parts of your issues, and then you've got somebody looking at your enrollment patterns and so on, you've got somebody looking at your staffing and your building use, get somebody looking at your transportation. And I'm going to tell you right now, before we get into all the depth, is that all those need to be, will need to be revisited. Once you get those recommendations, I am positive that you will have to, and I call the word right size, this budget for each one of those. And I'm going to show you some data related to them. Uh, locus of control. Some things you have control over and some things you don't. Now, I think most, as I'm a taxpayer too, so if I wasn't working with schools, I would think, what are they doing with all that money up there? Well, 
actually, you have control over some of it, but you don't have control over a lot of it. A lot of it is actually mandated costs. You have control over some of those costs to some degree, but let me put it this way. Your life would be miserable if you exercise too much control over those things. For instance, let me, let me make it up. Let's just say, I'm going to make this up as an ex-union president. I was a teacher's union president for 10 years. Let's just say I came to the table with you and say, look, you know what? We're trying to control costs, so we're not going to give you a contact for 10 years. So you could try and exhibit some control. I don't think it would go well for you. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So people can say you have control, but it's not as easy as it looks. Next, you have no control over a major revenue source, which is state aid. You are heavily state aid dependent. So the state makes up a formula. There are people in Albany actually make up the formula, and I literally mean the word make up the formula. Okay? And, uh, and they, they disperse the money as they see fit. So there's some things you have control over, some things you don't. Sales tax revenue is a big boost to your, your, uh, your school district. You are getting something many other school districts across the New York State do not get. Okay? And you are using that as part of your revenue stream to pay for the things that you are buying. And what you are buying is service. You're buying buses, you're buying education, you're buying courses, you're buying classrooms, you're buying benefits to the university owner getting at. You bought buildings, think about it. You're buying the lawn mowing. Right? You're buying every light bulb in the place. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? So the point is, that's a revenue stream. Now, if that revenue stream disappears, and there has been discussion in both Monroe and Wayne County about having that disappear, you will no longer have that revenue. The question would be, now what do you do? Well, you can't buy things with money you do not have. But you have other sources of revenue. Your two major sources are your taxpayers and the state. Well, just because you lose sales tax revenue, I doubt the state's going to run in and just give you a bunch of money because they feel sorry for you. Because other people don't get sales tax revenue. Many of them across the state, very few. I probably, in these two hands, you can count the districts to get sales tax revenue. So the thing is, is that uh, you would have to like to learn to live without something like everybody else. Which means you will actually, and I hate to say this, considering I taught economics, you will have less. Because the truth of it is, you will have to boost taxes considerably to cover that sales tax revenue. And considering you have a tax cap, you would probably need a super majority for the next 10 years. So I think that's going to be kind of a problem. That power plant closes, you get a lot of money from that power plant. And if that power plant closes, you have a huge problem with revenues. I mean very large. I'm actually going to demonstrate it for you. If you lose both of them simultaneously, you have a really, really big problem. And for a long time, or maybe for a short time. Because I don't know if how well you could overcome it, to be absolutely honest. Now, long-range projections, what I've done is, what we've tried to do is I've tried to figure out, okay, what's your spending patterns in this, what's your spending patterns with that, and I've driven your business official completely bonkers by going through every budget line in your budget for the last three years. Every line. Every expense. All 124 pages per year of every line. Okay? To find out where you spend your money. Okay? So we've got some patterns. Sustainability of the current budget practices. I think you're fine for another year or two, unless one of those goes away, one of those revenue sources. But after that, even then, you're going to have problems because I think you're in a behavioral pattern in terms of your economics that you're going to have to stop, and I would suggest, like, next year. And that is, is you are spending reserves and using cash simultaneously to offset tax impact because your expenses totally outstrip your revenue. <coughs> If you don't stop it, it will stop you because you are going to run out of money. The analogy I use is this. Remember I told you, I'm on the way home, okay? I'm going to have to buy gas. And this is what I'm going to buy it with. This money. Now, if that gas bill comes higher than the money I got here, I'm going to have a problem. I have to use a credit card or something. But then I'm kind of like buying into the future. If I can get the, the gas bill to be less than the money I'm holding right now, I'll have some money left over. But I'm also hungry. 
and I want to eat something on the way home. So what I'm going to have to do is watch how much gas I buy and still leave myself enough money to buy something to eat. Do you understand? But did I mention to you that my hot water tank went the other day and I had to pay $1,600 to get it fixed and I had to take money out of the bank. So within two days, I'm not only using the cash I have in my hand, but I'm eating my savings account at the same time. And that's what this district is actually doing. So I'm going to suggest that starting next year, you grind that to a halt. That will be painful. Would you say that most districts are doing that also? Not exactly. Not at the rate you are. Your rate is, is probably one of the fastest rates I've seen. You're burning through a lot of cash, especially as we go forward. Okay. So what I'm going to do is have some recommendations for you. Now. Uh, Here's the sources I used. You can read through them on your own, but I've used everything but the kitchen sink. I mean, I've contacted SED about you. I've contacted the State Education Department's uh, state aid unit. I've contacted all kinds of things to make sure I have the exact data. I've actually obtained all your state aid files. Okay, so I've got all that information. Two years of submissions of your SD3s. I've gone to the website, looked at aid calculations for building aid and so on. I've looked at your external auditor reports for fiscal years, your management letters. I've actually even read Board of Education minutes to find out what you've approved and when. Uh, I've looked at the capital expenses of the districts. You have fiscal advisors, so I've taken a look at your debt service through them and your buses and purchases, your bonds, all your bond anticipate, everything that you've done. I've interviewed your superintendent. I think we've talked four times. Uh, interviewed your assistant superintendent, I'd probably say probably close to 40 times. Uh, reports of the controller. I've read the controller's reports on your district as far back as I could find them, and I projected your, your, your teacher's retirement and employee's retirement system rates based on current expenditures. So let's just take a look at the first piece. The first piece is all about reserves. Every district is supposed to have reserves. Reserves are not a, a dirty, dirty name. They're, they're supposed to be there because you're, you have liabilities for the future. For instance, you have a workers' comp reserve, an unemployment reserve, a reserve for retirement contributions, uh, which is sometimes called the ERS reserve. You do not have a property uh, loss reserve. You have a liability claim reserve, an insurance reserve, a tax cert reserve. You're not allowed to have the reserve for taxes raised outside the levy limit. You're a reserve for the employee benefit accrued liabilities, which is sometimes known as the EBLAR reserve. You do not necessarily have a capital reserve for buses, but you have one for uh, construction. Uh, you have a, no reserve for repairs, no reserve for debt, and no other restricted reserves. By the way, you have no call to have a reserve for debt or any other reserve, so it's not necessary for you to have it, and you shouldn't have it at this point. Okay? But the key thing is, is that on these reserves, we're starting to tap these reserves. We're starting to transfer money out of these reserves into your budget to supplant your budget. Now, at a moderate level, that's not a bad idea, and that is actually expected by the controller and by a good business practice. But the problem is you can't do it at a huge volume because that number is finite. That amount is a finite number. So once you use up the money, so let's use my money in my pocket and money in my savings account, it's finite. Once I use it up, it's gone. So maybe I have to be more sparing with the way I use it. So what we've got here is though you've got some patterns of uh, budget neutral expense opportunities. For instance, currently there's a robust and significant revenue stream from the Ghanaian nuclear plant. Now here's your revenue stream. So for the, your current budget, you budgeted five million four fifty one to uh, thirty eight. Now let's just do a little simple math in our head, okay? So if that's five million dollars and you've got a fifty million dollar budget, approximately ten percent of your budget comes from the power plant. Now, if that all of a sudden doesn't arrive, hypothetically, you'd have to cut your budget by 10%. So let me give an example of what a real 10% looks like. Okay? Pretend you're the faculty. I line you all up. We count by tens. Everybody who's a one goes home and never comes back. I line you all up as O&M, operations and maintenance. We all count off by tens. Everybody who's a one goes home and never comes back. Does everybody understand how this is working? I line up the entire transportation department. We count off by tens. Everybody that's a one goes home and never comes back. It's because if you ever lose that amount, that 10%, you lose it forever. In other words, you lose it every year. 
you can't bring those people back. But at the same time, what you have to understand about your budget is it continues to escalate with the people and the things you still have. Right? Because who's ever left will want to raise, won't they? So your costs will continue to escalate, so you'll have to continue to cut. Now, the next one is the pilot neutral stream from the nuclear it, collectively. So let's just assume it's being lost, though. If you'll notice, look at the top number, 5 million four, then 5 million two, then 4 million nine, because your pilot is on a descending scale. Cumulatively, you're going to get $30 million over those five years. But it's decreasing by 243, then 235, 235, 235. So you're going to lose, even if they stay paying, $1,183,000 in five years. So my question to you would be, where are you going to come up with even $1 million? You see what I'm getting at. Maybe not the $5 million, but you're definitely going to have to come up, no matter what, even if nothing changes, you're going to have to cough up $1.1 million in five years against an escalating budget. Okay. Now, currently there's a robust and significant revenue from sales tax. You get 883, 852 currently, and we projected that for the next five years, that's 4.4 million. Whatever year that stops, you lose the 883. So what I did is I stopped it, if you go down to the next column, in, in 2018, which is 2017, 18 years, so there's the minus 883, for four years, you just lost $3.5 million. Now, let's just say if you only lose the sales tax at 3.5 and the Ghana is already going down at 1.1, automatically, should you lose that sales tax next year, you're losing 4.5. But just think if you lost them both simultaneously, technically, you could lose 25, say, 28, 30 million dollars. Over a five year period. Yeah. That would be a big problem. Actually, over a four-year period, as if you lost them starting in 2018. Okay. Okay. But even so, so you divide 30 million by four, and you still get about seven, eight million dollars a year. Big hit. Now you're talking one out of every 18 people, automatically per year. Okay. So then you got. The use of smart schools, which the district has basically is coming up with a plan with. Now, smart schools is a smart idea for you. It's not probably very smart for the state, but it's very smart for you. Because you can take care of your technology needs and get reimbursed pretty quickly as long as you have an approved plan. So that's a plus for you. That's what we call revenue neutral. What that means is the money spent would equal the money coming in. Okay? Now, the next part would be the current budget patterns on use of reserves. Right now, in your current budget, you're using $1.528 million in reserves. Now, what I've tried to do is I had Greg set up a schedule where we would decline, minimize the use of reserves over time. So 1.5 this year, I dropped it to only a million next year. So if I've already cut next year's budget for you by $500,000. Here's the one I just said, cut mm -hmm. 500 euros. Then I dropped it down to seven, then I dropped it down to 350, then I dropped to 150. But even if, though I drop it, we're still using $5 million of your reserves over the same period of time. So now what we're doing is, remember the money in the hand and the money in the savings account, right? Is now we could potentially lose the Ghana plan, the sales tax, and the reserves that would supplant those simultaneously. <laughs> this will hurt a lot. Okay. So let's take a look at all the scenarios I've drawn for you. I've got four scenarios for you that I think will tell you the story. So here we go. So this scenario is the current one with the current trajectory. So I have less than 2% tax increases, right? So I have less than 2%. I've got an annual foundation aid increase of 2.5. Now why did I say 2.5? I made it up. Because we have no idea what it would ever be but I'm assuming it'll be 2.5 just to give us a revenue increase. So in other words, I'm trying to give you a leg up by artificially giving you a revenue increase. Two ways, taxes and state aid. Okay, so 2.5 <coughs> is a combination of those things. Just foundation, so just, no, that 2.5 is 2.5 increase in foundation plus a little less than 2% increase in taxes oh. simultaneously. Okay. okay, good question, good for clarification. Now. We have this diminishing pilot, which you already have, right? So I didn't change anything there. 
And then what we have is current expense increase rates and your current IRS rates stay stable. In other words, they never go up. I'm a little worried about those rates moving because if anybody's been observing the stock market, it's practically flush with where it was at the beginning of the year or even within a year. And they're counting on around 6 to 7% yield. Remember how ERS and TRS works. So what I do is I have an actuarial table that tells me how much I have to have, right, for all the potential retirees that could retire. I look at your, your, your actuaries for your district, and I try and figure out basically how much it would cost. Then what I do is I look at my stock market yield, that's where they get a lot of their money, and whatever isn't coming from the stock market comes from you. And remember, you cannot fail to pay it because that money is what they call intercepted. Remember, I, did I explain this before how this works? You can't fail to pay your ERS or TRS because it's deducted from your state aid check before you get it. It's kind of like federal withholding. You know, when you get your paycheck, you can say, I'm not paying those taxes until I'm ready. Well, look at your check. They took some out. That's how it works. So you cannot not pay it. And they determine it. So I'm not so sure about the rates. But anyway, make a long story short, what we've got here is, is if you look at the yellow line at the bottom, you will see that is your rev total revenue line based on current trajectories. Now, I've looked at your building aid. I've looked at your regular state aid. The GEA is now gone. I looked at your transportation aid. Now you also have interfund transfers from reserves. Can you see the amounts in there? And some of those are from reserves, right? And some of those are capital reimbursements. And then on the other one, it says other. If you'll notice in your budget for 2017, 2073865 is sales tax, other revenues that you get that isn't in the other the previous list, which is miscellaneous revenues. And in some years, basically next year and a year after, smart schools money. So now all those are counted as your revenues. The yellow line re represents your revenue trend. See how that works? So it's going from 45.9 in budget 17 to 44.7. Does anybody see anything odd about that revenue trend? Yeah, drop. So I'm increasing your taxes, I'm increasing your foundation aid. But what's actually happening here is your building aid is going down by 2021 because you're retiring debt and your building aid is going away. So that is becoming a problem for you. Also, well, don't forget that the pilot is decreasing each year as well. Just a quick question on the building aid. Okay, as your building aid drops down, don't our payments to our build? To yes, the they will. Drop? So that's what I'm trying to say. Is okay. Just trying to show you that normally people would think their revenues would always go up. Yours aren't for a reason. When you get right. to expenses, I will account for the okay. other end of the equation. Okay. Just but to, that's all right. Don't. That's yeah. good to be clarified. In these scenarios you build out, is there any provision made for increasing state aid due to our assessed valuation changing if NA closes? Uh, no, but okay. I don't. Not sure that you will have that change. Okay. Our wealth wouldn't change. Uh, your wealth may change, and it may go down, but it takes three years, three years. In, at least. Right to hit mm -hmm. uh, at least three years, sometimes five, that's depending something on if been, they audit it. That's something we've been talking about. But what's going to happen, I think, is you might be held up in search jury claims over the value of that property. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Working with another district, and I've been in communications with a yep. third district that have experienced the same thing, whereby they thought this would happen, but all of a sudden, cert claims were, yep. were made, and it held up the entire computation. And therefore, you, you, you're, you're not you able to spend tell. that, you can't spend that money on right. it. Right. But you have other factors that are starting to be problematic. I actually have a slide on your wealth factors. Okay. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. But good questions all. So now let's just take a look at it. So to make it easier on everybody, I put the revenue total on the top. See the yellow line? And then the bottom line, yellow line, is your expenditures. But let's go through the expenditures so we can understand what's in it. So you've got expenses, general support, instruction, transportation, community services, employee benefits, debt service, and basically interfund transfers. Now let me explain what each one is. I only have to do it once, this scenario, and the rest of the scenarios become, I think, pro forma for you. So general support. What is general support? If you're familiar with the uniform system of account codes, if you look at your warrants where you pay your bills, those are everything that starts with the number one and has Two or, two or three zeros thereafter in the first four numbers. So it would be, for instance, the Board of Education codes, 1010s, ten all the 1010s. Ten 
but it's on, but you'll notice I got salaries and another. So the salary would be 140s, 150s, 130s, 160s, those types of things, but to the 1010s. Superintendent's code, 1240s. Business office code, 1310s, right? Lawyers, 13, or 1499s, and so on. But the biggest codes in there are the 1600 codes, which are your O&M, operations and maintenance, as well as your utilities, okay? So there's a bunch of miscellaneous other types of codes in there. But I've divided between salaries and other. Now, if salary trends continue, you'll see that the salaries basically go from your budget of 2.7 million to 3.066 million. See how I'm reading this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and your other, what I did is I actually crippled your other so it wouldn't move much, and I've actually almost frozen it right out. Here's why. What I'm trying to do is I'm showing you that I'm going to crush part of your budget, and it may not make a big difference because I'm not crushing it hard enough. To understand the point? Okay. Now, instruction. Remember, instruction is always the largest part of every school district budget, that and benefits, because you're in a people business. I mean, when you walk into a school building, you see tons of people. It's people working with people. So, what actually happens is, is that your instructional codes, the salaries go from budgeted 20 million 430 to around 22.5. Now, if you notice, that's a significant increase, but that's the big part of your budget. That actually takes care of the purpose of the school, right? Okay. Other goes from 4.3 million to 4.9. But if you look at the salaries of the other instruction, not to pick on instruction being an ex-teacher, but the truth of it is, because it's the largest part of the budget, when it escalates, it escalates at a greater numeric rate with the same percentage. In other words, if I'm making $30,000 a year as your custodian, and you give me a 3% raise, compared to if I'm making $70,000, we'll say as a teacher, you give me a 3% raise, right? My budget line will grow at a greater rate than would be the custodian's. <coughs> Have you factored in on the teacher salaries retirements? No, we, okay. we, we have not. We, because we don't know exactly who's going to go when. Right. And one of the things you're going to have to look at is pretend, potentially a retirement incentive or dimi diminishing this salary line through attrition. Right. Okay, obviously I don't want to let you fuck yeah, No, no, I just but, wanted to know. Right. No, I mean, this is a trend. In. Just a trend. trend. Okay. okay. Now, transportation, I did the same thing. Community services, we did the same thing. Employee benefits or retirement. Now, retirement is a function of salary. Okay, so it's a percentage against salary. Uh, Social Security is a function against salary. Workers' comp is based on your workers' comp premiums. Your health insurance is based on your contracted obligations and where they've been going recently. And I had Greg contact your provider to find out exactly where they are going to project them in the future. But because health, again, is another big number, and so is retirement. You notice know, so the retirement, even though I kept the rates the same, they go from 3.1 to 3.5 million. And the health insurance goes from 6.37 million to 7.5. So you automatically have in some built-in increases, even if you were, even if say 10 staff disappeared, you're still gonna have some increase. Now, debt service, and this is to your point, uh, Dennis, if you look at the far end, you'll notice I have it in bold under the debt service you'll see that the building's principal and interest drops like a rock between 2010 and 2021, okay, to show the difference and why that, that, that has been accounted for in that decrease. To your question. You understand what I mean? Yep. Okay, so that's all covered. Interfund transfers. Now, you have interfund transfers annually for two reasons. One is summer school special ed, and the other is cafeteria. Now, in the good old days, you didn't have to transfer usually much money into the cafeteria, but with the new federal guidelines, it's hard for a cafeteria to make it work, to be absolutely honest with you, in all fairness to the cafeteria folks. And the other thing, of course, that hurts in the cafeteria that makes it worse, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault, is when you, if you pay benefits to cafeteria workers, of course, because you're trying to treat them like human beings, the cost starts to escalate, and the federal reimbursement doesn't cover it. Okay, just in all fairness to everybody. Now, so now you have total expenses. Now what I want you to do is, year by year, just mentally look up and down on the sheet and compare the top number with the bottom number. And you'll see what's actually happened is they are getting out of, I would call it, out of sync at a greater rate. So I've tried to count for everything. So what I've done is this. I said, okay, we all should know, in all fairness, that I hope your budget is bigger than what you spend and that your revenues are less than what you get. Not by a lot, but by some margin. 
because you don't know. For instance, if I turn to Greg or I, I turn, turn to Mathis right now and say, could you tell me how many special ed kids will show up out of the blue in October? <laughs> we had 21 we had this, this year. I know. That's why I'm pointing this out. So my point is, is that if you build a budget to exactly what you think you're going to exactly spend, you will overspend this budget, which you're not supposed to do. And number two is then you will go into either that money you had in your hand or money you had in your pocket. You understand what I'm getting at? So it's built in as if, you know, you're going to get some more special ed kids, hence the, the staffing fees and so on. So what I did, though, is I said, okay. Knowing that, though, what was your, what I call, delta this year? Now, here's what I mean by delta, not to be overly complex, but if you budgeted $10 million of revenue and you got 10.1 in, you got 100,000 more in than you thought. That is advisable. You should probably get in around 2% more than you thought. And here's why. You know the amount of state aid they published in the paper for you that they told all the citizens in your district you were going to get? You're not going to get that. You, I hope you understand that. You're not going to get that. That's their estimate as of February, last February. That's their estimate. Right now, in my other organization that I run with the 433 schools, I'm finding out that the standard error for measurement between state aid published and state aid actually given is approximately $200 million. Otherwise, it's no big deal. <laughs> So the point is, is you have to budget as if you're not going to get it all, because you don't know that you're going to get it all. And those numbers are subject to audit. Remember how, your, to your question there, Ron, where you said, you know, what about the power plan, you know, the change in assessment, our, mm -hmm. our relative wealth? It takes minimum three years for that to hit the, the formula. But what also happens is <coughs> it takes at least two or three years for your enrollment data to hit the formula. Now the interesting thing is, the formula isn't even running, so they're not even using some of that data. So if it runs, then maybe we might have an issue. So if you'll notice, they're getting a little out of sync. So what I did is I said, okay, let's, let's just take a look at this, and let's take a look at some of the numbers. We're expecting that probably by the end of the 16 year, you have $1.5 million either in delta in revenues or expenditures. In other words, the sum total. In other words, more revenue in than you anticipated, or less expenditures than you had anticipated. But I've added that, I'm going to add that money to your cash and to your reserves every year. But I've also told Greg and Mathis, you've got to tighten up this budget. And they tightened it up this year. So we expect that you only have maybe $1.25 million at the end of this year. And if you tighten it up further, which I'm suggesting you do, $1.1, and then you come in somewhere around a million every year. Now, I know it sounds like a lot of money to an average taxpayer, but when you're running a $50 million operation, it's not a lot of money. Words, now, what do you use that money for? Okay, that's money that's called cash flow. Okay, so what actually cash flow is, is your state aid doesn't come in all at once or every single month at the right amount. It comes in when it feels like it. They actually have a schedule of different types of payments every year. Your tax money only comes in between September and October, correct? But you still have to pay everybody from July <coughs> on until that tax money arrives. So you need cash flow. That's what that money will give you. If you don't have that money, you will have to do something known as, well, for a RAN or a TAN. A RAN is a revenue anticipation note. A TAN is a tax anticipation note, which means you're going to have to go borrow money to meet payroll. Now, having worked in three or four districts where I inherited where we had to do that, it's an unpleasant experience because of three things. One is you've got to explain to everybody that you're broke. Number two is you've got to go beg for money because now you're broke who wants to loan you money. It does have a negative impact on your bond rating. And number three is, people charge you to go borrow the money. Not only in interest, but in what they call issuance costs. Okay? So we want to avoid that like the play. Next, adjustments to reserves. That's the amount coming out of reserves that I showed you earlier in that previous slide. All right? Now, the interesting thing is, is that while I'm putting 1.5 million in, the next year I'm taking 1.5 million out. You see how this is working? So what happens is we don't have a huge amount of, in other words, we're not like making up all the time for the money. Now I did ask that the amount going out of reserves be depleted rapidly. In other words, be brought down rapidly. Because I want to show you what happens because technically you're going to run out of them anyway. So I may as well deplete them. The next money is the money that you're supposed to have cash on hand for emergencies for any purpose. 
That's the 4% real property tax law 1318. Remember that? The 4% limit. And that's the money that is bolstered, and some of that money comes from that carryover money. Okay? So I'm not doubling up. I'm just telling you that's where it's going to be the source of those funds. Now, what I did is I put down the amount that you're allowed to have. That is not the amount you have. That's the amount you're supposed to have. So I actually calculated it for you so you could see it. Then what I did is I do something called the bottom box. Now, if everybody forgives me, I'm going to get up and actually point because I think it might be instructive. You have an assigned fund balance. The assigned fund balance is actually the difference between what your expenditures are and what your revenues are. Let me make up a number. Say, for instance, your revenues are $10 million and your expenses are $11 million. You would have to appropriate from some source $1 million to balance your budget because you don't have enough revenues for your expenditures. And districts do it every year, normal practice. It's not that they do it that's a problem. It's how much they do it. In other words, the degree. The ancient Greeks were right. Take it from a 10th grade social studies teacher. Everything in moderation, nothing in excess. That's how the controller likes it too, by the way. He must have been a Greek scholar. So the truth of it is, is that your budget, if you look here, you've got 45 million revenue. You've got 47.1 in uh, expenditures. You are short $1.23 million, which means you're going to have to appropriate from this year's budget into next year's budget, your own money, $1.2 million. Does everybody see how that works? Mm -hmm. But if I keep these projections going, the delta between each year grows. You understand it? In other words, the difference between 44 million and, and 50 million is now 6 million. Because what's happening is your expenses are rapidly increasing at a greater rate than are your revenues. Now, I haven't taken away the Ganae power plant yet. I haven't taken away any sales tax yet. The only thing that's going away is the building aid because you have decreased building, right? I've increased your taxes by around 2%, so I'm increasing your revenues there. I, made sh I pretended the state could pay you automatically 2.5% more foundation aid, but your pilot is diminishing by a couple hundred thousand dollars a year from the Ganae plant. Everybody see what I've done? So I'm trying to keep like a status quo kind of going for you, it, making sure you still get some source of other revenues. Meanwhile, your projections for your expenditures keep going. Now, you also have an, an unassigned fund balance. I tried to make that unassigned fund balance every year equal to the amount you're supposed to have. But I have a problem. All of a sudden, I run out of money. So everybody see what happened? So in other words, I tried to make it so you'd always have 4% cash, but now you won't have 4% cash because I need you to keep reserves. Now why is it 2 million sitting in reserve? Because if you remember back in your reserve page, you've got about 2 million plus in a capital reserve. You can't unilaterally jettison that. You would need taxpayer approval to use it. So I can't jettison it. But I broke all the rules in the last year and I took it anyway. So I have actually, by this year, 201920 20, at current rates I have actually wiped out all the cash you have and actually sent you in the year 19 or 2021 into a deficit but notice right now you're in great shape is everybody understand what I said look at this you got all kinds of fund balances but what happens is, as expenses start going up higher. <clears throat> so now you can see why I said to Greg, I, I, I'm not coming to with a proposal. You're going to stop taking money out of those reserves. Because here's what's happening. If we take a look at it, look at it this way. I'm putting arrows on the sheet now. So there's, now what's happening is you're out of sync with your budgets, out of balance. So you have to tap money, right, as an appropriate fund balance. Where do you get that money from? Either one of two sources, your cash or your reserves. And then what happens is, you're spending cash and reserves simultaneously. So what's actually happening here, you'll notice that your reserves, your reserve fund balance is dropping like a rock. Because it's not that you're using your 1.2, you're using the 1.2 in the same year, you're using 1.5 out of reserves to bolster your budget revenues. And then in the next year, you're going to need 2.25, but you're going to take another million out. So what's actually happening is you're taking money, um, money in his pocket, and the money out of the other pocket simultaneously. 
This is how credit card debt works. So, this, so, far, so the, the, the problem you've got is you've got to try and obviously try and work on getting some more revenues with the state so you can lobby the state till the cows come home, but I'm going to show you how difficult that will be based on your demographics. But the point is, is that it's really an expense issue. And I think when you get your transportation report, my guess is, looking at the transportation records I've looked at, is you have an unbelievable transportation system that probably defies economic reality. Unbelievable. And I would probably guess. Now, the good thing is you're buying your buses cash, which eliminates smart move on the part of the business office, because now what happens is you don't have issuance fees for borrowing, you don't have interest payments. So that's the only thing keeping anything afloat there in the bus situation. What about the money we get back on the transportation? Uh, you're, getting, you're, you're getting small amount compared to what you should get, because you have a lot of expenses that are not able. And what would they be? Almost like door-to-door -door delivery. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> to be absolutely honest. Yeah. No, I, it's right I mean, I'm looking at your records, I'm going, what the hell, how are they spending all this money? How many kids they got? Okay, and the other thing too is you've got to keep in mind that your enrollment is declining. But your system is, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound pejorative, but the thing is it's, it's above and beyond what most districts would do. It, it is not above and beyond what most wealthy districts would do. I mean really wealthy. I don't even mean like maybe 15 times or 5 times wealthier than you. It is, it's costly. And also what you've got is you've got, you know, o and costs, utility costs and so on for buildings that, that obviously need upgrading in many ways. Or the other way I look at it is, the first question I asked, you can ask Matt, this is like, how many buildings do you have? And he, he goes through each building. Why do you have this many buildings? Well, the public wants it. Well, they can have it. All they have to do is what? Pay for it. <laughs> I think we got an economic construct down. See, here's the rule of the world. The rule of the world is, and I'm not new at this, you can have anything you want. I mean anything. All you got to do is pay for it. Okay? We could have a teacher for a kid. We want it. Just got to pay for it. So the dilemma is, even in this first scenario, which I think is the most pleasant, you're going to run out of money at the current, at the current rates of expenditure. Okay? Now, I had also talked about a capital project with you. You say, well, how could we do a capital project? Well, you can make the capital project actually neutral because you have a capital reserve. You can actually make it so it has no impact on taxes. You can make the tax neutral. But the point is, is if you try and fix the building without a capital project, you will do it with no aid. So every dollar will be on the tax rate. We could make it so no dollar hits the tax rate. It's possible. Okay, so as you can see, boom, we run out of cash. We run out of money. Now, I've done, for those of you who don't like charts, who like graphs, I've done a graph. You know, they call it teaching multiple modalities. In other words, there's a number of ways you can look at the same thing, okay? And so what I've done is showing you that actually the distance between your revenues and the expenditures are growing and that the amount of cash that you're using is sending you into the abyss. Okay? Alexander Froggen? Yeah. Can I ask you a stupid question? There's no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I guess all it's right. in the eyes of the ball. <laughs> we have all these reserves that we have built in the past. Mm -hmm. Our revenue has gone up. Mm -hmm. How have our reserves have gone down? Because I mean, what I'm yeah, I know we've used our reserves, but what I'm saying is, to use small numbers, we spent ten dollars last year, we brought in eleven. That's a dollar left over. Well, we did that, and we actually got our reserves way up high, to where the state came in and yelled at us. Yeah, well, they actually yelled at you. Now, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest, based on what the way they, they yelled at you is, the state looks at things at a snapshot. Right, and I understand all that, but they told us to spend our reserves down. Now we did that, and we kept our tax rate flat, mm -hmm. and that was able to keep our reserves down. But I just don't see how we ended up in I, because such a discrepancy Because I think you spent them down too here. fast, and you shouldn't have spent them all down. Some of them actually should have been reserved for other purposes. That would be my suggestion. 
I think the thing is, is it's kind of like, uh, you know, if I go home and my wife says, geez, Rick, you know, geez, you got uh, 2,000 in the bank. I know, but the, uh, where's the water tank goes? Right. And that's what happened to you. What actually happened to you is you kept the expense ratio escalating rapidly, and you were using the reserves simultaneously, and the, the rates did not coincide. And that's what happened. Matter of fact, that's what's continuing to happen. All I'm doing, that's right. Remember I said to you, this is your current trajectory? Right. That's what I meant. Okay. So right now, as we're sitting here right now, you got reserve. You're good. Yeah, you got 11. Oh. You're good. But over time, you'll start eating them up. That's my, that's my worry. Right. Okay. Ours too. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, it should be. Yeah. And, and you're doing it right now. So here we go. Now, alternative two. Okay. Scenario two. Less than 2% tax increase, so I kept your revenues coming in, plus your foundation aid, diminishing uh, an aid, a pilot uh, at the same rate it's going. But I eliminated your sales tax revenue. That's all I did. Can I ask a question about that? You, you brought that up earlier and made a note. It, it, this is, I'm, I'm at, this is a question based on your experience, because I, I, I don't know how it would typically be done. Would the sales tax revenue just be cut off one year? Congratulations, it's now zero. Or would the county be kind enough to say over three or four or five years it'll diminish to zero? In many cases, well, first of all, it's all up to the county. Okay. Right. That's number one. Number two is some counties have been more, you know, planned about it like in two or three years, and some say, no, that was it. Okay, so, it, so it's crapshoot is the it's answer. It's crapshoot. Kind of what we've been told by the county is if they did cut it, it would be a gradual, a gradual right. decline over three right. or four years. So what I did is, just to let you know in this scenario, I simply picked next year. Snap. So if I could have picked a year out, you'd have a better scenario. If I picked right. three years out of it, but you get the it doesn't matter. if it's gone, it's still you'll coming. see what happens. Okay? It's gone, it's gone. It's gone, it's gone. So if you look then on your revenue side, if you look down on the revenue piece, let me just show you where it is. Remember where the, where the sales tax is. It is in this line right here, sales tax. So you can see it all of a sudden I just eliminated it. Okay? Okay. But I eliminated every year once I eliminated it. So I just picked the year, picked the first year. Okay? So who knows? Now, so you know how that page works then. So then let's go to the next page and let's just start creening through the page. So I kept your expenditures all the same, I haven't changed anything there. I kept the use of reserves the same. I kept the uh, amount of uh, uh, carryover the same. In other words, all I'm doing is making the effect being just the sales tax going away next year. And then I kept the 4% amount the same. And if you'll notice, what actually happens now is, is there's, there's your this year's budget, no change, but you fall further in the drink faster into the next year because you're short by the sales tax amount. We lose a year earlier. Right. So you can pick any year you started. I found a year just so you have a scenario to see how it would work. But what happens is you actually end up in the drink faster than, a year faster, if it was to happen next year. All right? So the point is, and if you'll notice, the delta is greater. Now it's at 6.9 million, right? Because we had to add the sales tax. And don't forget, it's a cumulative effect. It's, it, I remember I talked to a legislator about the GEA woman said, geez, legislator says to me, Rick, you know, you keep telling everybody you, they lost all this money in GE. That's not true. I mean, if we took a million dollars away from your district this year, we take a million dollars away from it next year, it's the same million. It's only a million. So obviously she failed fourth grade math. I don't know if she's a legislator, but the truth of it is, I said, no, it's a cumulative effect because my expenses keep right on going. So I lost a million and I lost another million. So give me a break. So that's actually what happens here. And what I did is did the same kind of arrows so you can see it just falls into the drink faster. I think we can cut through this fast. And there again, your deltas get wider, right, on the graph. Now, this one here, all I did was I eliminate, I eliminated the Ganae plan, eliminated the sales tax revenue here. And what I did is if you just go to the bottom line, you'll see it just simply fall into the abyss even faster. <laughs> okay, by the time we get to scenario number four, I'm ready to jump off the cliff. Well, yeah, I, I think you're gonna be, because uh, let's go to scenario number four and have some fun with it. But you can see the gaps are widening, right? 
the truth of it is, is this? These are real problems with real issues. And what you, and what you change in scenario four? Scenario four. Oh, uh, you know what? I said eliminate the sales tax revenue in scenario three. I did not. I just did the Ghanaian plan. Did the Ghanaian, uh, three is just the Ghanaian plan. Okay. Four is it's both. Something. I just saw. I just saw this right there. I apologize. Yeah, yes. So you might want to write that on your thing, just so you, you don't. Get I found it. Okay. <laughs> I thought myself. Wait a minute. Okay. So here I eliminated both of them. So, but I kept these other revenues going. And as you can see, you, you're really in a drink by now. Uh, you, you got a problem. Matter of fact, if you'll notice, you start having a problem right away, right away, like instantly. Mm -hmm. So if that plant pulls up stakes, now this is an issue that you know we, we're not taking lightly. I know we're trying to kind of be calm about this, but the truth of it is, you got affected by real people, kids, parents, employees, uh, taxpayers. Uh, you know, people's expectations for the school district. You have a fine school district. You know what I'm getting at? And all I'm saying is, is that this is why I'm glad to be here so we can start saying, look, you know, this is no joke. I mean, this is, we got some real issues here we got to start taking care of. And so what happens is you do fall into the drink. The delta becomes just huge, as you can see by the graph. And so I'm really worried. I don't know about the survivability of something this, this immediate. Of course, it is the worst case scenario. Next year, they both don't show up. So it is like the ultimate worst case scenario. But the survivability would be very difficult. Now, you've got to remember that even though you're in a hole by 11 million, if you back up a page, you're really in a hole closer to 25 million. Because what happens is, in other words, the delta between your revenue and expenses is 11 million, but you're actually 25 million into structural deficit. Does everyone understand what I just said? So all you have to do is half the school district expenses, just half them off. So now you line up people and you come off by twos. Because you're so dependent on these revenues. So to your, your point, Ron, when would this possibly affect our state aid? Does it matter if it happened immediately? No. You see what I mean? Now, I don't know if that'll happen. I'm, gosh, I, as I was doing this, I kept saying, oh, please. I mean, I hope those good day people hang out or they have some kind of sliding scale down or, or something, you know. And it, but if they simply just pull the plug and say, that's it, sue us. We're not paying. We're done. You can sue them to the cows come home, but you won't have the money. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is kind of what happened, like Mexico, Oswego, with the land closing up there. They're this is basically right what's away. happening. Basically what's happening. Now, happening. here's the thing. Not exactly. The difference between you and them, because I'm working on them as well, is that the, uh, the power plant agreed to a temporary pilot to offset so it wouldn't just plain cut the cord. The problem they're ha they, they would probably have is can they hold on to the pilot? In other words, <coughs> there's an agreement for the pilot, but you know, you can't get blood from a stone, so you know, and if they sell it to another corporation, then who's the new plaintiff, shall we say? You know what I'm saying, Tim. And, right? and, so, and Oswego had to cut 50 teaching positions. Yes. Even with even yes. with the pilot agreement, right? And so what happens is, yeah, and and uh, I think I don't want to quote Mexico, but they must have cut four million dollars right out of their own budget. I know because I, I helped them do it. It was in gut wrench. Is that what their pilot was? I can't remember what their pilot. I can't remember the amount. But don't forget, all your numbers are different. So you know, and you got different student bases. And I mean, numbers. that's just four million. So I, yeah, it's four million. It's four million. Qu yeah. So it's it's a lot of money. It was a big hit. Especially so what we district. ended up doing is, to be honest with you, we had a cut. Uh, we cut proportionally. Some parts of the four million was actual literal people, unfortunately, and things. Right? Don't buy this. Don't buy that. Don't buy this. And then these people got to go. And some of it was carryover money, so that they could regroup, recruit, re regroup in hopes that maybe through attrition they would get you know more help over time. Does that make sense, Tim? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there's ways out, but because we could we could start cutting that carryover money, that whatever it is, it adds up to you know. You're like, grasping straws. But, but yeah, <laughs> but the point is, you're still on a steep slope down. Okay. Now, so we know the deltas. Now, what I also did is I just kind of analyzed your budget. If you go to this this slide, like even with these things that are going on, because I had those taxes increase, you'll notice that your proportional share of your budget as a revenue source, becomes more tax dependent. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm getting at? So you're becoming more tax dependent uh, rather than finding any other source. In other words, 
The pilot isn't showing up for you by increasing, you know what I'm getting at? No, no big new business industry getting additional pilots. I mean, I have no knowledge of any of these things. So what actually happens, you become more tax dependent. And we can't, even though state aid is a big piece, truly we can't count on it increasing. The next one is technically, through the first scenario even, we simply deplete all the types of fund balances. Every time, pick your, pick your type of fund balance because you're just trying to survive over time. Okay. Rick, I just have one question. Sure. Um, Greg, what's the most Ganae ever paid out of our budget? I know we're next year they pay less, but were the other pilots more? Is this this pilot less? The the pilot that expired last year was a ten million or a ten year pilot, and it was for two hundred sixty million assessed value a year times whatever our tax rate was. So you have to look at the, that 10 year period and see which you had the highest tax rate. Was it more than $5 million though? Well, Carl, at one point, Gene paid one third of, all of the total bill for the district back in the 70s and 80s. They paid one third yes. of the total bill. Yes. Cost. Okay. That's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so over the years, we have adjusted as a district to taxpayers paying more and they paying less. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, in a way yes, in a way no. <clears throat> if we were to go way back, not too far back, well, well let's just say to the seven, eight, seven, eight, eight, nine year, you had huge tax rate, ta or, excuse me, huge state aid increases. That's when the new foundation aid formula started, then they defunded it with GEA thereafter, but you had a couple bumps in there that were very large. And we had some big increases in uh, tax rates too. There was a time and a period here that we were oh, yeah, you've had, you've double all digits. Of it. Exactly, you experienced all of it. Yes. One third. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe that's possible. Yeah. yeah. We used to say that one third came from Ghana, one third came from the state, and one third came from the other taxpayers of Wayne Central. <coughs> wow. Okay. Now, for your edification, and I don't know if I have to go over every single line of this, but what I did is I put in the calculations of tax impact should things go away. For instance, what I did is there's your sales tax. This is the warrant that you issued last August for your taxpayers. This is the exact warrant. And if you'll notice, just let's see, let's see what else let me just get to do this. What happens is basically here's your towns. Here's where the equalization rates in the towns, the assessed values, the true values. The percent of true value of each town is a part of the district. Total tax is to be raised. Less sales tax, remember, because there's sales tax in there. And therefore, the levy for the town, and here would be your tax rate. Okay? okay. Pretty, pretty simple computation. You do it annually. Okay. Now, what I did is, there's the sales tax. So now, if the sales tax was to go away, those numbers would hypothetically go away. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So it would then change your tax rate. So therefore, what I did is the loss, bingo. There's the amount. There was the tech, what you what you wanted to raise in taxes in total, but you would get no sales tax. Therefore, there would be your new rate. So technically speaking, just to you know use an example in Macedon, uh, you'd go from twenty nine twenty dollars ninety seven cents per thousand to twenty one eight eighty eight. You see how it worked? Mm -hmm. Now to make it easy, because a lot of people aren't really used to this type of all these computations. What I did is. I kind of did this. Considering you have different full values, people, some people like to look at full values, some people like to look at you know, or unequalized values called assessed values. So I actually did everything in both ways for you. So mass then tax rate 2097, 2188, difference would be 91 cents. It would be actually, instead of what they got for an increase, which was like one or less, it would have been a 4.3 if this was done over again. In other words, if, in other words coming into this current year, 1516, uh, you had no sales tax that year, that's what, it, what you would have. And so I did an average and a median. Remember the definition of it? I usually do medians when I can, because the definition of average is my head is in the oven, my feet are in the freezer, and on average I feel just fine. <laughs> so because averages sometimes don't mean a lot, you know what I mean? It get kind of goofy. So I, I do medians as well, which would be the middle score. So then what I did is I said, okay, then I converted everything back into full value for you. And what would have happened is basically he would have had a $187 tax bill increase for his $200,000 house, 91 for $100,000 full value house, 
and 137 for 150. But then when you average everything together or median it, uh, it would come out to these numbers down here. So you would have actually gone to the taxpayers and say, look, we just lost the sales tax. Can you make up the difference? And that's what it would have cost. And that would have required a super majority. Right? Yeah. Now, I also did it another way. <laughs> And this is, technically speaking, at this is the assessed value way, so you can study this at your own. Here's basically what you actually gave the taxpayers for this year. Now, I, remember, I keep saying this year because we're still in the same fiscal year, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're telling people, I'm asking, hey, it'd be 1.57. It really, in terms of the way it would look to them, it would appear to be a 6 on average. In other words, it would be distributed based on the value of their house, but on average, it would look like a 6. Right. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? So the thing is, is it's kind of a hit and a half, right? I'm just going to tell you, even though it doesn't look like a lot of money, uh, when you go to the taxpayers for it, it all of a sudden becomes a lot of money. Why would Penfield and Webster be such a tiny percent? Because there's such a small percentage, Some small percentage, percentage of the district. district. But wouldn't their percentage have to go up just like everybody else's percentage go up? Well, they also have different equalization rates. Oh, okay. okay. And then, so then what I did is, how realistic is it for the district to make a possible loss of sales tax or pilot revenues by simply increasing taxes to cover the cost? So in other words, somebody would say, well, what does this all translate into taxes, Greg? Well, real property tax is a current trajectory. Remember, this is the almost 2% a year, so I just made it up. Okay, here's the pilot. So in the first year, it would be a 28% tax rate increase if the pilot goes away. Now, why is it a 26 the year after? Because the budget went up. Right? right? Think about it. And, but the least it gets to be in five years is 20%. So if you did sales tax, it'd be about 4.3 on average. Remember, some were six, some were five, some were three. It's 4.3 on average. But if you if they both happen at the same time, it'd be 32.3. So needless to say, it would be a giant hit. Now, I do have experience in this realm because I've actually passed tax rate increases of 37, 32, 24, and 18 in my history. So it can be done, but it really hurts. And you're still alive. And I'm still alive. <laughs> and that's because what happened was I went to these districts and they had just turned down a merger and they had no money. So basically I had to go to the population and say, you want to school or not? They said, yes, so we did. And both schools are still thriving. Now, let's take a look at Ron's issue, though, that you brought up, Ron, which was a good one. And I'm actually I'm kind of proud I was thinking about it ahead of time. So here we go. <laughs> this is some of the basis of Foundation Aid formula. The formula is not totally running right now. So some of these are marginal. But they, if it ever ran, these would all be working. What do you mean it's not running? What, is, what do you mean by that? Oh, mm. OK, here's what they do. <laughs> What they did is, in 2007-8, they actually had the foundation aid formula run, but they only gave you a portion of the money you were due. Oh. Now, hold that's on, that's so cool. actually not the whole story. I'm following it so far, got gotcha. Yeah, so far, but it gets worse. The next year, it ran again, only they gave you a smaller proportion. But your amount went up, because what they did is they gave you a proportion, smaller proportion of the proportion you already had. So in other words, they gave you, I'll say, 37.5%. It, and then they gave you another 17, not another 37 and a half of the total amount you were due. So technically you're getting like 49%. Then the next year they froze it. You got no change at all, regardless of anything in the formula that changed. So you inherited 5,000 kids. You got no more money. You lost 3 million kids. You got no less money. The next year, it was frozen again. The year after that, it was frozen again. The year after that, it was frozen again. Then the year after that, the institute, it was frozen, and they instituted the GEA. And what they did is they took, they took a lot of money from the, the poorer districts first because it's, it's an economic construct. Let me give you an idea. So here we are at the board meeting party, and Matthew says to me, listen, uh, I got this wad of money. It's just busting my pocket. Could you hang on to this for me? I said, sure, and he hands me a wad of money. And in it, I see there's 20s, 10s, 5s, and 1s. So I started saying, I wonder what he wants to do with money. And the party's going on, the party's going on, and he never says anything. And I said, I know he wants to, he's going to distribute the money. Let me start doing it. So 
So I started handing out 20s until I ran out of 20s, and I hand out 10s until I ran out of 10s, and I start handing out 5s, and all I got left is these 1s. And Mathis comes over to me and says, you got my money? I, said, well, I thought you wanted me to hand it out. He said, no, we got to use that to pay for the food. I said, do we need all of it? He goes, no. Fifth grade math problem. How would I collect the most money the fastest, even if I didn't need all of it? Go to the people with the 20s. Who are the people who got the 20s? Well, there's an inverse Sorry, correlation. There's supposed to be an inverse correlation to state aid and poverty. Mm -hmm. So it would be the people who had the most poverty. Okay? And then they kept the GEA going until this end of this year. So, but when they did increase foundation aid over the last three years, what they did is they based it on what it last was in 2008-9. So he said, well, what did they get in 2008 Let's give them 3%. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. So that's how it was. Okay. Very artificial. Okay. Now, this is what's called the pupil wealth ratio. Uh, this is uh, an important part of the foundation formula. This is your property values. So considering it's a wealth ratio, here's how it works. Remember, there's two measures of wealth ratios in the state of New York that they use for state aid. One is property, the other is income. The reason is because you're taxed on your property and you pay it with your income. Now, the ratio works like this. Let's just say the average value of a parcel property in your district was $50,000. And the average parcel property in the state was $100,000. The ratio would be 50 to 100, right? In other words, you would be half the state average, 0.5. Well, in 2011-12, you were at 0.65. So you were just a little above half state average and property value. Look at it now. 0 0.806. Your property wealth is increasing, so should the formula run, you'd be entitled to less money comparatively. You understand what I'm getting? Mm -hmm. Not that you would get less, but as they're divvying up the pie, and they were giving out shares, shall we say, of it, they wouldn't give you as big a shares maybe you used to get, but you'd still get an increase. See what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. Now that's only half the performance. The other half is called the alternate pupil wealth. This is the income. And the same holds true. So if the average salary of a person, remember how you fill out your income tax? You just did it not too long ago. You put in school district code, now they know how much everybody in your district makes. They compare that to the state average. So if it's 50,000 for Wayne and it's 100,000 for the state, you'd be 0 0.5. You were at 0 0.717. Now you're at 0.765. So you've increased, not by a lot. But here's the interesting thing. You can increase on either one of those metrics without having any of your numbers change. The state average can change. What happens if the average income was 50,000 back in 11, 12, and state average was 100, you'd be at 0.5. But if all of a sudden state average today was at 50, you'd be at one. You'd look like an average wealth district. So this is something you cannot control. But the formula isn't running, so it doesn't really matter a heck of a lot. But people are trying to get it started again for equity. So this may be a fact. The next calibration is called the combined wealth ratio. The combined wealth ratio is where you take the property and income values and you combine them. But you combine them mathematically. In other words, you take each and divide it by two and then add them together. Or, with the new math, you add them together and divide by two. Well, one way or another, you come up with the same number. <laughs> So if you'll notice, yours has gone from a 0.685 to a 0.785, which means you look wealthier. Okay, remember, if there's an inverse correlation to aid and wealth, which means more aid to the less wealthy, you're moving in the wrong direction. Now, there's another metric. It's called enrollment. The first number of every state aid formula starts with how many kids you got. There are 40 ways to measure a kid in the state aid formula. The state aid formula is 70 pages long. It's an algebraic expression. Now, <laughs> you're, <clears throat> believe me, I've been studying it for years. So here you go. Your basic enrollment for state aid purposes, all other things being equal, because there's total weighted pupil units, there's tablets, <clears throat> quick blues, fat blues, there's all kinds of different ways to measure a kid. For instance, a high school kid, in some measures, is worth a one and a quarter kid, and an elementary kid's worth a one. 
special ed kid getting X amount of resource room is worth a 1.2 because he gets 20% more service. See how it works? So there's a million ways to do this. Then there's attendance, who shows up and who doesn't versus who's enrolled, right? So there's a whole bunch of ways. But hypothetically, the biggest one, 2463 was your 1011 enrollment for your 1112A. Don't forget, see the word estimate? Mm -hmm. Because it was subject to audit in that year. Look at it now. 2267. So if I was going to pay you for something per unit, you understand what I'm getting at? Per unit, it's possible for me to escalate the rate per unit, but your number of units go down at a faster rate than me increasing the rate per unit. So if I'm paying you a dollar per kid, and I make it a dollar ten, but instead of having ten kids like you did in the beginning, you only have five, we got a problem. Well, actually, we don't. You do. And so part of the problem is you have declining enrollment. Okay? Now, the good thing about your number is, the number 2,000 is significant. All the research, research would indicate that the most, the districts that have the greatest potential ability to become cost-effective, efficient, and have the greatest economy of scales are districts between the sizes of 1,500 and 2,500. So your potential is there. You just got to do it. Now, it's a U-shaped curve for those who want to study the research. In other words, it's like the Goldilocks thing. Too few kids, high cost per student, right? Too many kids, a lot more problems and issues. Like, go to Buffalo where they have a lot of kids, you'll see what I mean. You see what I'm getting at? Because they tend to be urban centers. Now, the other metric is called FRIPL, Free and Reduced Price Lunch. It's a federal program and a measure of poverty. Now, your district has done an excellent job at this because this has had an effect on your state aid over the last few years. This is one of the few metrics they've actually used, and your district has shown tremendous promise here. Not that it's the promise you want, but it, it, is, it is important. About 23, 24% of your kids were eligible for free and reduced lunch. Now, 30% are. And that has been used to help generate your reduction or restoration of your GEA over the last five years. And it has been used in part, part of the formula to get you additional foundation aid, whichever, whatever you got. So that is what they call highly correlated. It has statistical significance of 0.71, I've calculated. So the thing is, is that that is good. That means you're paying more attention to free and reduced price numbers. The problem is they only measure K through six kids, and it's a three-year average. So to the point about how long it takes for things to have an effect, you know, you can find another 100 kids, but they'd only count 33 of them each year. You know what I mean? So that's how it work. The last number that's a metric that you should be aware of is what's known as the tax effort ratio. And that is residential levy divided by the district income as a percent. 4.2, 4.3, 4.3. So you have actually had a fairly stable tax effort ratio. That's good. And that, by the way, is slightly below the state average. I think the state average last year, where you have 4.34, was I think 4.7. Okay, but you know what an average is, right? I mean, it, you know, we're also comparing it to Long Island or someplace else, right? But the key thing is, is it has been fairly stable based compared to your levy compared to people's income. So here we go. Let's summarize. Long-term revenues are suppressed. <coughs> tax levy due to tax cap voter influence. You know, you've got a tax cap calculation here that kind of restriction, right? You have, you have a depressed, the pilot is depressing you because it's going away. Even if it doesn't go away instantly, it is actually decreasing over time. Potential jeopardy is Monroe and Wayne County sales tax. And current trajectories are largely unpredictable in foundation aid, although in my scenarios, I gave you two and a half percent. The loss of the revenue from the sales tax and the Guinea pilot will have significant effect on the district's budget. Upon occurrence, the budget revenue related expenses will become less stable. And that's probably an understatement. It will simply become unstable. Uh, simple absorption of the tax levy of either or both amounts of these revenue sources would probably require supermajority taxpayer approval due to the tax cap. So automatically you will be in supermajority territory for a long time unless you're right sized the uh, expense side. Expenses appear to continuously and rapidly increase beyond revenue projections. Future budgets at current revenue and expenditures uh, trajectories will grow out of balance and at increased amount. I showed you that in the scenarios. The use of significant amounts of reserves is unsustainable long-term method of to balance budgets. The amount of reserves, the amount of funds and reserves is finite. Some of the reserves exist for current liabilities, other for future liabilities. Now here's the thing. Let's go back to Dennis's point about the reserves. 
you have an ERS reserve that's supposed to be used to offset ERS costs. So when the controller tells you to pay them down, that's fine. So what do you do when those are gone? In other words, it's <coughs> for him to say. You understand what I'm getting? He's looking at a snapshot. You have an EBLAR reserve, which is, can only be used under General Notice of Law 6P for when uh, uh, separates from a district by an employee for an amount in cash owed to them for some purpose, whether it's retirement or unused sick days or personal days, but it can't be used like for their health insurance or something. And failure to use that fund appropriately is actually a misdemeanor. So now, a lot of times the controller writes down, well, why don't you pay down debt? Well, unless you have callable debt, and most districts don't have a lot of callable debt, you can't pay down debt. Okay, so that so easy for him to say. So what I'm trying to say is, is that slow and steady wins the race. Everything in moderation is what well, that should be. Your it, it's an interesting analogy to say that the state controller looks at a snapshot because every time this comes up, I find it hard to find value in what the controller says. Uh, let's put it this way: uh, I've got a whole bunch of pictures of my youngest daughter. Half of them, she's got her eyes closed. If I use that as the photo of what she looks like, nobody knows what she really looks like. So rest my case. Yeah, I, I, you got me. Yeah, oh, I got you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the effect in district cash and reserves, unrestricted and restricted sources of funds, are currently tapped to provide revenues for two simultaneous purposes: the assigned appropriate fund balance to offset taxes, and the interfund transfers. So what happens is you're actually diminishing your cash at a greater rate. So you're, you're taking from, from every, every place you got money, you're taking it from there. At current trajectories, the district may experience cash, and cash problems, and I talked to you about the RANs and the TANs and all the rest of it. So I think you've, you've got the idea there. I don't think we have to belabor the point. Uh, so I, I think you can't backfill with those things. That is a problem. And, I'm worried, and, and considering you, you could probably get away with a, a, a really good uh, capital project that would secure the facilities of the district, uh, with minimal, if any, tax impact, uh, you certainly do want to not want to do anything to hurt your bond rate. Not at all. Uh, public awareness, I think the key thing is, I guess this is the first step about public awareness in terms of this type of thing. So if you get it out, you're trying to be transparent, you're trying to let the, the public know that the board is working diligently with the administration on looking at where we're going, what's going to, what could possibly happen in the current. The next one is recommendations. Here we go. Significant efficiencies and economy scales must be undertaken by the district to restrict the growth of expenses. These include but not limited to don't buy it unless you need it and it was budgeted. Does everybody understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. Seriously, you got to tighten that budget up. I mean like tight, like like you know, E, high E on the guitar. Bing, you got to hear it. That, in other words, we can't all of a sudden have people going, you know what we ought to do, let's go buy this. Okay, that's got to go out no matter what level inside the school district they, is not supposed to occur. Now, I've, I've given some recommendations to Greg about how this could ha happen uh, and so on. Like, for instance, when I was superintendent, we had the same problems. I, had, I, I took all the field trips that we ever took, and I found out how much every, everyone cost. And I found out, do we really need every one of these? You understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. And then we can only, we're going we're gonna to agree to spend this amount of dollars. I'm not going to make education decisions for you. Here's the, here's the, you decide where you want to go. There better be curricular validity to it, but here's the cost. We're not exceeding that. That's it. I don't want a surprise field. Now, we always put a little money in case the team wants sectionals or something like that. You get my point. The truth of it is, is, you know, I was so tired of it. You know, every single grade twice you're going to the zoo to go to the zoo. Nothing against going to the zoo, but I think everybody stands my point. So, in other words, you've got to really figure out what is mission critical for the district. Shared services with other districts. Now, I, I share transportation. I even shared lawn mowing. I bought one tractor. They bought another tractor. We hired three kids in the summer. I didn't have to hire my own M guys to be sitting on a, a lawnmower all day long. And we looked like a golf course. Matter of fact, I had actually citizens calling me wondering why we were squandering, what we were doing with all our money, if you understand what I just said. But the point is, is that we, we shared the cost, took care of it. Uh, I, I shared transportation facilities. I shared transportation routes. For instance, I don't know if anybody here is driving to BOCES through here from a district that neighbors you. Why aren't they picking up your kids? You understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Because Billy, Ethel, and Sharon live here, work here, and drive bus here. You understand what I just said? But you don't work for them. You work for, I think it was like 2,237 kids and thousands of taxpayers. 
You understand what I'm getting at? That's why this is gut wrenching. Okay. Uh, shared services with BOCES. Now, the interesting thing about BOCES is BOCES, when you share services, not every case, but in many <coughs> cases, they provide a revenue stream. So if BOCES can do it faster, better, or cheaper, why aren't you using them? Okay, well, I'll tell you why. Because Bill, Sam, and Bernice work for you. You understand what I'm, you understand what I'm sending you a message? Okay. Right size, now, not, and, and so they create a revenue stream. So I remember when I was, I had to start cutting a bunch of these, they said, well, they, I had staff on me, don't cut us, cut those BOCES people. <laughs> yep, those BOCES people generate revenue. You understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So, all right, budget right sizing, staff student ratios. Are you using your, you're going to find out, Paul's probably going to come in, Paul uh, Sversky, excellent, top notch, come in and tell you about building use, but the thing is, is, you know, when you have multiple buildings, you're in attendance zones and transportation, you've got people probably, I'll make you a bug, I'll make you a bet, based on the records I've seen, it has to be true. I'm just guessing, I don't know this for a fact, that buses are actually passing attendance zones to pick people up to go to schools they used to go to or wanted to go to or their mom went to, or you know, Aunt Betty wants there, or, or somebody teaches theirs, so I'll make you a bet. Right, so you have customized everything and there's no way for that stuff. Um, and also student, student, like how many, you know, in this school you got maybe 12 in a classroom and this one you've got 15 and then this one over here you got another 15. Well, if you had them all in one spot, you could have two people doing it instead of three. I mean, there's things to think about. Right sizing, uh, services, efficiencies, effective, you got to start measuring what you're doing. In other words, you would never want a staff to be sitting down at the end of the year saying, well, we got $400 left in our budget, what do you think we ought to get? No. You budget for what you needed, and then after you bought that, that's it. Your money just dried up. We've got to count the money. You understand what I just said? Okay. I'll never forget the time I was an assistant superintendent, and I had a, a band instructor came into the band, and I thinking, what the heck is he doing here? And he had like a suit, you know, like a suit in a, in a bag. You know, like you carry a suit in a bag, you just want to bring in a suit. They go, what do you do, bring his new suit in? And all of a sudden he said, you know what we need? A marching band. We don't have a marching band. What kind of school are we? She and the whole board, board tournament, 55000 for the uniforms. Here's what, here's what, here was my order from the board president. Rick, get the uniforms. So what? Find the money and get the uniforms. You understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. The next meeting, we had somebody else show up for this, and then the next meeting for that. Does everybody understand how this works? Right. Okay. So all of a sudden, you know, it was like, you know, it was like, just unbelievable. Building grade level and attendance zone configuration adjustments will be gut wrenching for you, but I think you got to try and find a way to minimize them or eliminate them. And the way you eliminate them is you bring people together in one spot. The most successful schools that are, like, give you an example, merged or haven't merged are the ones that are all on one campus. Everything's in one spot. They can share staff, social work, and go to any building, right? There's no travel time. You don't lose all that time. Need versus desire. Must-haves versus nice-to-have. Service and offerings. You've got to start figuring out exactly why you're buying everything you're buying. Now, you don't have to do that. That's why you've got him. Remember, this is how this works. I'm going to be honest with you. He works for you, everybody else in the whole district works for him. Nobody in the district, except for him, the treasurer, your lawyer, and the accountant work for you and the district clerk. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hint, hint, hint. Because here's the thing, if it, ever, if it gets goofed up, you'll be the first to know, okay, as you're sitting home and not attending these meetings. Now, there are structural, human, <laughs> political, and symbolic nature to the change in expectations. <laughs> right, it's, it, it's true. I'll tell you right now. I'm working with the school district. The three incumbents just lost because they made some tough decisions. So the new people coming in say, we're going to straighten that out. We're going to undo all those things. So then they looked at the finances of the district. We had a meeting, and they go, oh, my God, we had no idea. You understand what I'm getting? It's like, oh, yeah. oh really? Well, good. I hope you straighten everything out. Let me know how that turns out. I'll be at my house, by the way, when you're doing it. So there are impacts of change. Change is tough on people. I'm going to talk about it in a second because I think it's worth it in my report. Other considerations, need versus desires in terms of capital construction. Paul's going to talk about uh, your, your building configurations, probably your building use. I think you've got to take a solid look at it. And this may be before the re revenues dry up. Let's just say they don't go away all at once. 
You better make hay while the sun shines, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Preferred versus other options. In other words, there's some people, I'd like this, I'd like that. Well, remember, the, the option is, is you either pay for it or you don't. Right? So everybody has a nice to have, <coughs> but until all of a sudden they got to choke on the cost. Status quo versus alternatives. I think you got to figure out what's on automatic pilot. And, and some things are on automatic pilot. For instance, this person retires, we simply replace them because we've always had that. Maybe we don't need that now, or maybe we need something different. Current cost structures and potential cost structures. Building condition survey pointed out numerous things you have to do in this district. It's not like you got nothing to do. Remember, if you do these things with a building project, you will actually have to check, charge the taxpayers per dollar, right? That's, that'd be a 1600 code. Next page. Avail yourself of smart schools. Dr. Matthews already has plans for it. Dr. Craig, we already included it in our financial plan. It's a brilliant idea. Reserve plan needs to be updated. Now, here's why. To me, your reserves aren't too much. Just some of the money is in the wrong places, right? So I think if you move it around, you'll find out you don't have too much reserves. You probably have the right amount. It's just got to be moved around into the right places. So you got to look at those reserves long term, and as I suggested to you, you stop tapping them to the level you're tapping them starting next year. You should use some of them every year. That's the purpose of them. But you don't have to use them at this velocity. Long-range strategic plan must be aligned with the current and future district fiscal needs and goals. I've given you some scenarios. We know we've got the 1617 year already locked in. The question is, where do you go from here? My suggestion is you revisit your plan annually and go through it, right? Next, secure and seek legislative assistance to offset loss of revenues in Ghanai nuclear facility. I've talked to the superintendent and business official both numerous times, because I know them both for years, of uh, Kenton, Kenmore, Tanawanda. They're going through the same thing with the coal fire plan. Obviously, you know I'm working in Mexico. And you've got to try and get some legislation to try and soften the blow. But as I mentioned to everybody I talked to about this, is softening the blow and eliminating it are two different things, right? So if they say, wow, we throw you a million bucks. Okay, good. That's only as good as the million bucks last. In other words, it will soften the blow. But what you want to do is still start right-sizing that budget anyway, so the million lasts longer, if you understand what I just said. Okay. Uh, next, create a plan that maintains fiscal integrity of the district, which is in progress because we've already got this plan here, as transparent as possible and update as new variables occur. So, in other words, our first effort of transparency here is in public session to show everybody exactly what we figured out, what's the pluses and minuses of what's going on. Because remember, we're all spending other people's money. Right? And we, we owe it as a civic obligation, and you have a duty, a fiduciary duty, which you should sign an oath for to do this. Congratulate you on it, but this, you're going to have to make some tough decisions. <coughs> but the key thing is, as new variables occur, like all of a sudden we find out, as Dennis points out, maybe they're going to phase out the tax, sales tax, so we could re put that into the scenario and see how that plays. You see what I'm getting at? So you can update these things. Okay, if the district loses both sales tax and Ghanaian pilot, pilot revenues in a short period of time, the district's finances would become unstable, period. Thus, the ability to right-size in light of such a drastic change would be very difficult. I'm, I'm thinking you're in big trouble. Uh, and uh, if that was to occur, I would seriously, and I hate to say this, this is my last recommendation, it's the worst one, and is you may have to consider merging with another district. Because I don't know if you'll be able to sustain it and still people think it's what they used to be. Is everybody understand what I'm getting at? Okay. Uh, and you probably got a couple, but you have to find a willing neighbor, and your and the populations both have to be willing. So let me just talk a little bit about this change piece because I want to remember when you go through change, and I'm delivering a very tough message tonight. I'm being very hard on you, but I feel you know it's no time like the present. If I soft pedal this thing and try to make light of it, this is really a serious issue for you that you're facing, and I think we've got to take a serious look at it. But what happens is. Tomorrow, the place will probably be buzzing. Oh, God, what are they going to do? Well, what does this mean? Oh, geez. I mean, what's the, who the heck is this guy saying that? You know, you'll see, what's gonna, you see what I'm getting at. So structurally, everybody's going to want to weigh in, if you understand what I'm getting at. But you have to remember something. You are the board. Nobody else is the board. You're the board. In other words, you not only have authority, but you have responsibility, and you will carry the weight of it. Okay. Now, I'm not taking my recommendations lightly. I'm going to actually, when I'm done, I'm actually walking out and I'm driving home. 
after I get some gas and buy some meat. But the truth of it is, is that, so the point is, is any citizen comes in here, nothing against citizens, but I'm a citizen of a district too. If I show up to a board meeting and I have a bright idea, I have no responsibility, no authority. You understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So you, it, it, it's on your shoulders. Right. And people, other people have to understand that you has to make the decision. Because everybody has a bright idea, okay? Human, human resources. People are going to feel needy and powerless. Oh my God, am I going to lose my job? I'm going to do this. Well, right now you're not in imminent danger this 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 year or this coming year. But the longer you wait to start making changes, the deeper you could fall into it. So you've got to start making changes. I always suggest to schools you do things through attrition. <coughs> Remember, you're working with people. It's a people business for God's sake. People's livelihoods, their houses, their mortgages. You know what I'm getting at? Here you're worried about the Canadian plan, maybe laying off 350, 360 people. You don't want to add to the carnage, right? So the point would be is you've got to find a way to do this as gracefully as possible. And you need as many partners as possible. Rick, can I jump in there? You yes. said something, I actually wrote down a question here, and you just touched on it. Um, I don't really want to get into the, the pointing the finger game of how did we get here. Uh, my question is more on are we ahead of the curve? Right? Yeah, so you're, you're a bit ahead of the curve. Because I don't really, it's not that I don't care how we got here. The reality is we're here, and it is right. what it is. So uh, by... Mathis's recommendation of pulling a subject matter expert in and saying, because Mathis, in all fairness, hasn't been here very long. In fact, he's a rookie, right? You're still in the, your, fir your first year, and we're already jumping on this at his recommendation. He said, I know a guy, I've identified a problem, I think we need to jump on this. So it, it feels nice to say, seems like we have jumped on this problem and identified it early. But at the same time, it sounds like you're almost jumping up and down, almost frightfully, saying you guys are going under. Yes. So it, I like to say it feels like we're ahead of the curve because it seems like we got a good recommendation from Mathis and a good subject matter expert to identify the problem. But at the same time, the problem you've identified is that we're not sinking. Like, we've already hit the iceberg and we're in No, the no. Here's where, I, here's where I would characterize it. Is that if we keep going to where we're going, that's why I call the first one current trajectory. You're going to hit the iceberg kind of I think sooner or later you may lose that like Canadian plan and that sales tax. And that, that's the ones that are killers. The key thing is, you're, I would say that at the same time, you're ahead of the curve because, but there's two parts to these things. Identifying a problem is one thing, but the next part is, until I see you do something about it, you are going to see. And that's what I'm saying. Are, are you aware, Rick, that we've already started to take steps to do something about it? For example, um, you talked about staff attrition. We've already uh, offered a retirement incentive. There have been some staff attrition. Good. Uh, there's been a spending freeze. We are in, a, in the process of trying to accumulate additional funds to carry over. And the status quo, we, we have already looked at it. as we find resignations, retirements. We are looking at whether or not those positions need to be filled. So we right. have already started Right, I brought those up as I've done this study. So okay. I've asked for those yes. things as okay. I've done the study. I've talked to both these gentlemen about that as I've done this. That's why I'm including in my recommendations. But the truth of it is, is, is that concerning we don't know when the sales tax, in other words, slow and steady wins the race in terms of that too, mm -hmm. unless it go, those two revenue streams go by instant. Right. Right. And then, all, then the wheels will literally come off. But the point is, is you still have some big pieces the question I would ask is, okay, so we froze expenditures, but if expenditures are too high, freezing them is not going to be enough. Okay. Second, you're going through attrition, but if it's not enough attrition, it won't be enough. Third, a retirement incentive is in the eyes of the beholder. In other words, so let, let me make it up. There are districts that offer all kinds of retirement incentives, and some people take them and some people don't. The thing about a retirement incentive is who takes them? I'll give you an example. If it's your best physics teacher and you can't find another one, you're going to wish you didn't have the retirement incentive. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be careful of how these things work, if you understand what I just said. Sure. Okay, so my point is, is all those are steps in the right direction, but to me, they're amount of rate and degree. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, I think you're ahead of the curve because we're talking about it now before the sales tax goes away and before yeah. the Canadian right. goes away. Yes, you're taking steps, but we can't gauge right now whether they're enough. But my, my guess is, is that considering each of those is a big hit, I mean a large hit, the steps have to be large too and significant. Does that make sense? Yeah. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say to you is, is that I think what's going to happen, though, is when all of a sudden people start going, holy cow, then you'll know you're taking steps. Well, I, I, I tell you, I'm sure I'm not the first one at the, sitting at this table to have already heard comments being made that are um, 
the board screwed this all up, and now we're paying the price. Here's I mean, the that's thing. been said, and I'm sure I'm not the only one sitting here that's heard that. So well, to and, me... And, and there's more coming. Right, but to me, that's irrelevant. The thing is, what do we do now? I mean, I hate to say this, but every time I cut my finger, I could see myself do it. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? Right, uh, okay, so what the hell? So my point is, is, okay, you know, hello, I gotta take care of this now. I can kick myself in the can later. But I, I think that's it. Now that's, that's why I'm going through this thing with change because it will create, there's, there's be tension and yeah. conflict over it. That's why I'm pointing out these things. I just yes. got a quick question. On the pilot agreement that we have with Gene right now, is that, I mean, they have to honor that over the next five years or can they bail out of that? They can bail as soon as they can do whatever. Mm -hmm. So they could, I don't want to ask them that. No, go ahead, go ahead. They could do right. kind of whatever they wish. If okay. they don't, if they're already at over $100 million that they've lost at Gene. So they could come back and say, we don't have money to continue to, to pay the taxes. Take us to court, right? right? They've already said that kind of to us, right? right. They could do that. Right? Well, I didn't know. I mean, right. so they've signed an agreement with them. It's, it's a handshake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, it's an it's agreement if they can stay in business. Then they're right. in line the problem. Uh, and then we'll be honored by the, 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 the subsequent company if somebody else buys it. The other problem they have is why wouldn't they be paying a pilot on a property, Dennis's point, that all of a sudden became worthless? When I was superintendent of Spencer Port, I walked into a meeting and 15 minutes later I had a 4% tax rate increase. And it's because the, what they did is the assessors called me in to let me know that they took one of the huge uh, Kodak the buildings facilities. and turned it into a $100,000 shack. <laughs> you understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. I wasn't asked by anything. Oh, it was just to explained. So we'd like you to let you know, Rick, you'd be the first to know. Well, oh, thank you for that. 15 minutes, it was over. So because, remember how Kodak downsized like a rocket, I'm sure you were affected because you're over here in, in Wayne. I had board members who were watching their tax portfolio and their retirement go right out the window. I mean, it was hard to hold a board meeting with them weeping so much. And I'm not trying to make fun of them. What I'm trying to say is these people were really hurting buckaroos. I felt terrible. Uh, but and, and I'm trying to raise taxes, and you know, you see what I'm getting at to get the school district to survive. Because my first day in a job, we had ninety-five thousand dollars in the bank and a two hundred fifty thousand dollar payroll on Friday. See, see, so I mean, you have these types of issues, Tim. So I, I just like to thank you for the work you've done, and I, doing these studies there is a good step because then we get the, the yeah, knowledge and the data that backs up any decision we do. We can make it based on, you know, right. real things that are going on and and how we can do it, make it better. I think you can. So let me just wrap this up real quick. All I'm going to do is caution you that there are two roles here. One is the superintendent, one is the board. And the key thing is, is that, technically speaking, uh, you want everything open to public comment and so on, but the thing is, is that you can't, you know, the squeaky wheel does not get the grease. You have to make some tough decisions, okay? And, then, and, and, and that's how it's got to go. And what I've tried to do is outline which each responsibility is. I'm going to wrap up with this little Big Rocks experiment here. If you heard the story of the big rocks, I'm going to make this very quick. So the professor has a jar, and he's got these rocks, these big rocks. He puts the big rocks in the jar, he says to the students, now the, the rocks are sticking up over the top of the jar, as you can see on my slide that's on the screen. He says, this is the jar full. Students say, yeah, it's full. So then what he does is he takes out some small pebbles, and he throws them in, and they go all around the big rocks. Is it full? Students say, ah, it's obviously a gimmick. Probably not. So he says, well, is it full? No, I don't know. We don't know. We give up. What are you trying to do? Pulls out some sand. He throws the sand in the jar. Sand goes between the pebbles and the big rocks. Is it full now? He takes a ruler, cuts the sand right off the top. Yeah, it's full. Really? He grabs a jar of water, puts the water in there, and fills it right until you see the surface tension over the top. Is it full now? The kids say, yeah, I guess so. He said, well, this is all about life. If you want to get something done, you want to fill the jar, you must put the big rocks in first. Because if you don't, they won't all fit in. What I'm trying to tell you is you have to go after the big items first. Don't nitpick your way through this thing. Do big things, sweeping things, transportation, maintenance, facilities, right? Capital project, da 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 da. Do the big things first. Comments on the Friday, you know, or tonight? Questions, anyone? Um, of course, they'll say. Um, if we find, with all the data that comes back from the other professionals that are helping us with this study, like you said, transportation, let's just use that. And they say, 
you need to do, revamp this, do this. It was, <coughs> there's four or five runs that could be poof, gone. Do you poof, gone it? Or do you take it in small bites? Because the way you're painting this picture is, you need to cut bait now. I would cut bait faster than slower. But you just got through saying you're working with people and you have to do it slow. Right. So as you, much you as rip possible. The off, well, not? in some cases you may have to. You try to avoid it, but if you can't, you can't. Some things are will naturally occur through attrition that will actually probably help you and it'll be fine. But they may not be quote enough. So instead of laying a whole bunch of people off, you've offered a retirement incentive. So let's just say I'm going to make up numbers. Five people take the retirement center, but you need seven people's worth of stuff. Now you got to lay off two people instead of seven. You see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So that's the way you would work that. But there are going to be some systems that the band-aid may have to come off. Now the other alternative, of course, is, and I hate to get into this type of alternative, and I don't advise this alternative, and that is, okay, we'll put it on the ballot that uh, if you want these extra runs, you can have them. It's just everybody's going to have to pay another zillion dollars, and you can have all the runs you want. But remember that when you do those types of things, it's subject to the tax cap. You have to have a super, a super majority. And then you can have the will of the people do it. But the truth of it is, is that uh, some of these things, you, will, you, you have to eliminate some of those things. You just have to do that's it. That's why we're elected. That's, that's why you're here. But it's the same thing. If you find that you know, staffing-wise we're uh, too heavy in some areas, you know, you're so, not talking something that costs two thousand dollars. You're talking something with benefits and everything. It's it's terrible. Well, you know, it can be a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, I would like to go on a European cruise for twenty thousand dollars. Apparently, I'm not going. Why? I don't have the twenty thousand. It hurts. I love Europe. Thing is, is life's tough. You are spending more than you're getting. You've got to think of something. So it's going to be unpleasant. I'm trying to tell you now. It will be unpleasant. Tim? And if you look at it as far as it's for efficiencies, we haven't been efficient, obviously, if we can get some of these things back. So we're not going to cut a program. We're making things more efficient. So it's something that we didn't need. And obviously, with the finances, we need to do something about it. So here's the thing whatever way it works the best. I think Tim's got a point. The thing is this. So let's just talk about frequency or rate and degree, should we say. So if we find out the 10 routes are not needed, do we eliminate the whole 10 routes? Well, here's what you can do. You can eliminate five of the routes and just hope that the sales tax doesn't go away. If it goes away, then we should eliminate the 10 routes. So your ball is in your court. That's what you get elected for. It must have been a hell of a social service. <laughs> <laughs> you, they just must have been glued to you. I, I did okay. <laughs> I had, I had an SF grants and stuff. I did real well, so I, I was very proud. But I'm not sure. You know, I, I wanted to. Can you go back for a minute to, to 29 and 30 in your slides? Board, I just wanted to share with you that um, as you go back. So he talks about your Bowman bill and he looks at all the different issues and he talks about there's a structural issue, human resource issue, people connecting with people. And there's the political things that we will go through as we start to right size and do things better. There's a symbolic, so everything we do, it'll create a symbol for certain people in their minds, right? Um, and so we want to think through that. Please, I want you to know, as you go to the next slide, that our next step, our team, is already working on what do we do? How do we handle? How do we resolve? And we will, we've been very proactive. We've been talking through this, right? Absolutely. As we get the data, our team is discussing it. In fact, I was talking with our administrators today. We had a full meeting. We're talking about... How do we do this? How do we bring about um, the change that we need to and yet continue to, re to keep Wayne at, as Wayne, basically? So what we will do in the near future is we will bring to you a variety of plans and options and opportunities, and we'll ask the board to consider those, and then we'll, come, we'll go from there. Our team is already working on this. I want you to know that. Um, and here's the thing. So, um, Phil, you, you have brought up a question, right? A good thing about all of this while it is something that makes you jump for a minute, um, we are being very proactive rather than reactive. If something were to go wrong, we'd be in a state of reacting, right? And I know when you hear some of these data, it makes you kind of react, right? But we are, we are being very proactive. The studies, all of these things are helping us so that we can respond in a very solid, um, 
rational, thoughtful, thoughtful comprehensive way to, the, to these issues. That it's I, I think that this table knows already what you and your team are doing. If we didn't know that, believe me, we would find out quickly. Uh, what I was getting at more isn't the perception of the board as much as the audience that's going to receive this tomorrow morning. So, uh, right. I mean, like I said, I, I can speak at least for myself that I'm confident that uh, I don't, you know, I like to think we're ahead of the curve on this. But I, what, what I do know, what I am confident in, in, is that you and your team are already reacting to this. Mm -hmm. I'm looking more at the maybe the political or the symbolic version of yes. what is going to start coming our way. And, and so, and, and so are we. Right? Because we know, right? Like this is the work that we're in. Everything that we do, right? It sends. It has all of these different kinds of things that are attached to it. So we're working, and we'll continue to work and share with you where we're at as a district. We're constantly trying to take a pulse of the district and talking to people and getting out there. So you know, as you begin to change or right size or do things differently, some people accept that they understand it when the data is in front of them. Some people. No matter how you do it, they won't accept it, right? And then some people, you keep the door open, and over time, they're, they're able to be able to buy in, right? So we, we are working on all three of those scenarios. How do we how do we do that? Right? <coughs> At the end of the day, though, for all of us, and I know for you definitely, because I know each of you, right, it's about our kids. We're trying to secure our kids and make sure that the district is sound and that the district can get out of this pattern and, and do better. And uh, so we, we're going to continue to work at it. And I can assure you, board, that we'll be back very soon um, once we get all this data in with where do we go next. And we'll be talking with you and asking you for your feedback and looking for approval on cer certain things and, and just tell it, you know, helping us to, as we move forward, basically. I want you to know we're going So our administrators, this is just, this this just today, time. yes. And this is online. Um, this morning I talked with our administrators about it, so they're not surprised. Right when they when they this happens tomorrow, as you said. <laughs> so Michelle uh, has seen it as well. Michelle, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, she has not seen it. Uh, none of our union folks have seen it. But I've been keeping them in the loop as to how we're doing. Right? Kim will tell you. Like we meet and we talk about how things are going. All three of the unions are coming together with me to sit down. And we talk about the study so that people stay in the loop, right? Um, but you know the staff knows that this is video, right? So that this will be out. We want to be transparent, right? And we'll be coming together to work with them. Um, but we're working at it. We are, and we'll, we'll be back. And we'll come back as we move forward together, for sure. The good thing you have to remember is most districts let things happen to them. Right. <laughs> you are not. And you've got to be congratulated for that, and so does your leadership. You, these two gentlemen have uh, driven them nuts for months. But the truth of it is, is they know why we're doing this. And I think, I think you're on the right track. Another just a short thing that <coughs> this didn't happen overnight, first of all. I mean, this has been, I mean, our district um, overstaffing and use of facilities has been happening for a while, correct? That's irrelevant to me. Okay. No, I know, but I'm just saying, is that not correct? And, and what's really, I know, but, but here's, I'm going somewhere with it. Okay. And here's where the real impact is coming now, is the impact is coming that we have these lingering things, the Gene and the tax money, that's overshadowing all this and really making us look at it. Yes, probably. Here's the thing you also got to look at. Let's just say these things have been occurring for a long time. It's kind of like this. Well, while we had it, we spent it. We used it, and people got a benefit from it, and people were better for it, and they liked it more. Mm -hmm. Fine. It's kind of like, you know, I used to teach it, teach economics, and I explain to the kids, like, look, you know, if you're the, you know, if you have no money, okay, there's certain things you would look at and say, that's a luxury. All of a sudden, you win the lottery, or you get a big raise. Then all of a sudden you say, that's no longer a luxury. I'm going to do that. I'm going to have that. I'm going to buy that. I'm going to use that. And then it becomes part of your life. And all of a sudden, if you lose your money again, now it's back to a luxury. Mm -hmm. okay. no, I so exactly so people saying. say, oh, great. I wish they thought this a couple years ago because I didn't know this and I had this job and I counted on this. But look, you had a job for these years. I don't know what to type. Right. No. So, I mean, you, you bought this thing. We got, got this thing. You had this transportation. You had this. You had all these great things. Now, when we, we have money, we're certainly able to do it. No, we're not. Yeah. Now we have these yeah. big elephants in the room that are really affecting up where we're going in the future. I went to work at 14 when my father came back when we bought our first house. After he closed on the house, he went back to work and told me he was laid off. 
I can't believe We had it good for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And people go to the casino, and you say, oh, how'd you do? And they say, I oh, I lost $1,000. And they're like mortified. But then you ask them the next time, oh, well, I only won 1000 Right. It's the same money. It's just how you're looking at right. it. it. You know, change, change, the impact of change is what it means to you personally. Seriously, change is a personal thing. Yeah. The further you are from whatever changes, for instance, if, I, if I'm out in your district and I'm not affected by the transportation system, you're not going to raise taxes and you're not going to do this, I don't care what the heck you do, maybe. You know, I'm making this up as you see but if it's all of a sudden I can't get my kid picked up at the door every day, and all right, he's got to walk to the corner, or you know, what the heck, the kid's got to stand in a rope, and or you know, on the transit and say, well, what the heck? Well, how come? Well, I hope they're doing it in every place, right? Or why are they doing it? How come they screwed this up? Doesn't matter. We just don't have the money to do that kind of thing anymore. We used to, but we don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's kind of what I was trying to say before: is, is where we are now is what it is, and it's. Really, as a as a board, I would only, I can only encourage the board. And Mathis is control his own executive management team. But as a board, we should be very very. Um, co we should concentrate on drawing a line in the sand and saying it's not our responsibility to say, "Hey, it wasn't me that got us here." It 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 doesn't matter how we got here, and right. we don't want to say it was the administration before us, it was boards before us, because it it might it not be matter. true, and it doesn't matter. We we are here, and only we're what matters right. is how we're going to move forward. Very wise. Every district I've taken over, I don't know why, I'm attracted to districts that had financial <laughs> issues. I don't know, I just like the challenge. But when I walked into the board, I said, look, I'm not going to say, I'm, you'll never hear me say the public meeting how we got here. Because it really doesn't matter. I'm not going to blame anybody. This is not a blame game. First of all, I'm an educator. And you're a board of education. And the big thing is, is you, you got something, so where do we go from here is what it's about. If you want to blame, then after you retire 30 years from now, you can talk all about it at the coffee shop. But right now, we got some issues we've got to resolve, and that's where your focus must be. Yeah, I agree. You must dedicate yourself to it. I, I would like to just uh, thank you for the uh, delivery. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like not beat it around the bush and hitting us in the face. No, I'm pretty direct, I think. Oh, boy, were you. You were an excellent choice on yeah. Mathis' part. Well, wise man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not saying that because I'm saying that, but seriously, when he first came to me, what he looked at and studied, and I looked at a couple of documents. I said, "Okay, here's what you, you're, you know." I suggested Paul. I suggested TAS because I obviously, you know, I only have so much time. I'm trying to run a 433 school district organization on my own, and so, and I'm working with 18 other other school districts. So the point is, is, but you know, here's the best in the field because you really got to get on this thing. And he embraced the idea. And kudos to you and him and and Greg because honest to God, Greg, uh, I have a, a disc filled with your data. That I've gone through, and you know, look on page uh, 109 of your ST3 from three years ago. I see a number here. You know, I want to see what was that for. I mean, seriously. So I've driven everybody nuts in the district, and the secretaries have been great. Everybody that calls has been wonderful. So just everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Sue. We all set. <laughs> we all set. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so board. Um, We'll be back on Thursday night at our board meeting, and we'll share a little bit. And um, as I said, um, our, our team is already working at it. We'll come back with some plans in the near future as we move to next school year. And uh, uh, we have uh, another report that's coming, uh, a workshop coming very shortly from uh, Dr. Uh, Siversky and Mr. Exley. And um, I'll share on Thursday, we also now have uh, the transportation piece that is done. Uh, they'd like to schedule that out as well for us. So I'll come back on Thursday and we'll have more information for, for, for you all and we can kind of go from there and just kind of get all the reports done. They're, they're coming in now. So. Any other questions for anybody else tonight? This is ahead of what you had planned, isn't it? In terms of the, we are, yes. We're trying to get out as much information as we can to the community, especially the teachers and the entire staff before the school year is out. Um, you know, over the summer, people were not around. And so we want to make sure that we're very transparent and everybody knows what we're doing. So when we come back in the, in the uh, fall, we're able to start thinking about decision making and where, where we want to go next, basically. So, you know, you don't want people to be gone and then, they, you know, they've been kept out of the process. So people know it's videotaped, it's there. And also they've been able to move through as the year's out with getting things done a little faster too. So, yeah, so a couple weeks earlier than we thought, so, which is good. Any other questions from anybody else tonight? Okay. 
Well, I'm going to say goodbye to Rick. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.